air is Congressman Tom Davis, Republican of Virginia. We seek an environment that is not driven by crisis. I do not minimize the magnitude of the challenges that remain in restoring full confidence in the public school system. We have to work together to ensure that successful academic achievement and social development is the hallmarks of the system's reputation. In fairness, it should be acknowledged that meaningful progress is being achieved. I want to thank our witnesses today and all those who have played a role in that effort. This subcommittee continues to be very active, aggressively pursuing public policy developments and oversight review intended to facilitate the successful revitalization of the District of Columbia. The current reform effort underway in the district's public schools is a significant element, a very significant element, in the overall revitalization. Recent events, including the decision of the bond houses in New York to upgrade the district's debt rating, is evidence that overall efforts in the city across a wide front are producing results. The leadership and vision being provided by Superintendent Arlene Ackerman and her team at the public DCPS, along with the support and the direction provided by the Board of Education, the emergency in conjunction with the superintendent and the Corps of Engineers. Uh, the school board has started working on that. They have a staff person assigned to them, and they will uh, meet the deadline on that. I'm assured of that. But uh, the ultimate uh, goal uh, is to be certain that by June 30 of 2000, they have the tools to do the job, but more importantly, the understanding of what the job is and an agreement with the superintendent of the distinction between policy development and day-to-day uh, -day operations. Uh, thank you. I should add, I'm optimistic that it'll work. <laughs> well, I think we all want it to work. But we do. It, it, we, I mean, uh, we really do. We didn't feel good about doing anything that would deprive us. But it gets to a point where we, you know, we had to step in, and we have some uh, new members now that are, that, are, that are untested, but in many cases weren't part of the problems in the right. past, and we want to make sure that, uh, that we transition it. I think that would be where this committee would come from. I think Ms. Norton would, uh, would concur with that. Um, finally, just on the, uh, the charter schools, that was briefly discussed as we moved on, the implementation of charter schools as being a part of the overall plan. Uh, they present a great opportunity if it's done uh, correctly, and uh, they can all sometimes go the other way as well if it's, if it's not done. Uh, what, what is being done? What, how do the charter schools fit into the strategy? Well, we certainly provide the support, uh, but it's really sort of a separate process now. The Board of Ed serves as one ch uh, chartering, uh, um, body and then there's another um, body. But, but I guess my yes. question is, are we being reactive? Somebody wants to start a charter school and the school board decides if they cut the mustard or are we saying, you know, here's an area like technology where if we did a charter that would focus on certain items that could bring in uh, a, a, a consortium of technology companies coming in and specializing in this that we could be active and let's go out and recruit that. I mean, are we still in a reactive mode on this? Well, I don't know because I'm not involved in either of those processes. So the okay, board of that's my question. Yes. That's, that's, my, that's my question. Yeah. I can, I can speak a little bit to that because uh, we've had several oversight hearings on what the Public okay. Charter School Board is doing. Uh, they have been reviewing a, a lot of different applications. And I can tell you that uh, what a, a proponent for, of a charter school has to go through is extremely tedious. It's not easy to start a charter school. And they have charter schools set up in terms of technology, uh, hospitality, um, uh, mathematics. I mean, they have all kind of specialty areas, and I think they are becoming more proactive in terms of the selection process and in terms of the criteria they're utilizing in order to decide who to award those charters to. But, but Councilman Chavis, the, the concern, I mean, it's not a concern. That's the way it works a lot of places. But to really make this work, you can be proactive. You can say, you know, here's a void that the public schools aren't hitting right now due to rules and regulations and other things. And you go out and you incentivize certain groups and say, you know, we could really use a charter that would be in one area. The city's done very well, not just with charters, but some of the magnets it has. And I've been very impressed with some of the kids I see coming out of Banneker and coming out of uh, your uh, Duke Ellington School for the Arts, and it's worked very, very well. But charters can serve that purpose, uh, too, if they're started appropriately. And, and we're happy to, to help you get the consortiums going. There's a, there's a lot of interest in this region, in this region. 
about helping uh, provide the, the quality education to these kids. And charters are a great way sometimes where you don't have to work within the existing rules to do that. And if you're proactive, and uh, this could include some input from Ms. Ackerman in terms of these are areas where we feel right now the school system could use uh, some help because we have to deal with everybody in the school system and there are some niches where if we had a charter here, we can be proactive. This is the kind of things we like to help with. I would just uh, add that I have been meeting with the uh, representatives of both of the chartering authorities and have been meeting with them together to ask the question, uh, what is the rationale and the criteria they're using to uh, address the needs of the overall school system? And I think they are thinking about that. At, at the outset, I think their criteria was more along the lines of what is a strong organization that can run a school along certain lines. But if you look at the pattern now, uh, many of them, the math and science uh, uh, strategy for some of the schools says we know where some of the gaps are and we believe that we can contribute to the overall school system. More of that needs to be done, but I think they are thinking along those lines. So the marketplace in itself is starting to define. Okay, that, that's all I needed. Thank you. Ms. Norton. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Uh, the Chairman called an entire hearing on the school count, and we're pleased to uh, read recently that the school, school certainly can count now. You have 75,483 students. Uh, but if I may say so, um, I always thought, particularly under you, Ms. Ms. Ackerman, that you all would learn to count the students. As I regard that as a um, ministerial act that somehow if you get enough folks in place who, uh, who have done it before, that, that that could be figured out. But you have not dealt with my problem. You really have not dealt with my problem according to your own release. Um, and here I'm reading from the blues. Your, your own uh, uh, auditors who conducted the, who performed the student census, as it is called, and here, I'm, here I am quoting, identified continuing problems such as the lack of student documentation being maintained by DCPS and the public charter schools to verify residents. Going on, the individual charter schools have their own standards for determining residency. Now, this is from your release. My problem has never been, you know, whether they are this many more, that many more. My problem has been where do they come from? And as long as we can, particularly now that we cannot do, and, we'll, and as, as for the foreseeable future, we'll do no commuter tax, the insult to injury it adds for folks who happen to be coming into the District of Columbia to drop off a school in one of our public schools or now our public charter schools is really something. I hear the chairman asking about proactivity in our charter schools. Well, you know, Virginia and Maryland, they can't get charter schools at all. Because, because, because they, they are virtually blocked there. So what happens? You may have people from Virginia and Maryland seeing this new blossoming charter school movement in the District of Columbia where we have more charter schools per capita than any place in the District of Columbia, they could be ripping you off <laughs> because we still have this residency problem. Now, I know that, that Ms. Ackerman went to great lengths, great lengths to indicate what residency, what we should use to verify residency and the wide open things like what church do you go to, uh, uh, what, what, those kinds of things were eliminated. But if you've got almost 5,000 children in charter schools and they are determining standards for residency, I at least have no confidence that the charter schools are uh, educating D.C. students. And I don't even have confidence that you are because they say, your own auditors say, lack of student documentation being maintained by the D.C. public schools to verify residency. So I would like to, um, I would like to um, uh, ask you, perhaps Mr. Chavis knows something about this, how, how you could, uh, be, how you yourself mm -hmm. uh, can be confident that you are over 
seeing this expenditure of D.C. taxpayer funds only on D.C. taxpayer children in public schools, whether they are public charter schools or schools under your direct control. Well, we went through, as you know, an extensive process uh, last fall to ver around verification. The problem we have when we talk with the auditors is what we kept as um, a proof of that process. In some schools, there was um, the checklist and signed off by the person, the staff person who verified. In others, they actually kept the documents. And there was some confusion this year about whether or not the documents had to be kept in every file. What we did have was, though, a verification that they had been checked and what was checked. And um, what we've done for next year is to be clear about that. That was the problem that we had, and when we brought the auditors back, I think they were satisfied that we did indeed have a process in place and that we could verify it. The problem we had is what we kept in the permanent records, and next year that will not be an issue. Uh, as it relates to what happens in charter schools, we did not have that same process for charter schools. There was a separate process. Why was, and, that, why was that, Ms. Ackerman? Um, That's not in your best interest. Well. I know, money. but we have no... public school money per pupil, public school money that goes to the charter schools. So why wouldn't you insist that they, in fact, use the very same process that you have forced on the public schools that, that are non-charter schools? Well, I'd like to insist that they do, but I, I don't well, think that I... And, and that will happen. I mean, we've noticed that that's been a problem. We're, with the escalating number of children that are accessing public charter schools, there has to be some continu continuity in, in the uh, enrollment and making sure that the residency are, uh, uh, includes D.C. residents. So, uh, in fact, Ms. Newman and I have been talking about the best way to do it. If it needs to be done legislatively, it will be. If it needs to be done in rulemaking, we will make that happen. Very much appreciate that, to clear this problem up once and for all. Um, um, could I ask you a, a question? But, and by the way, I'm sure you'd be concerned about that, Mr. Chavis, because some of the see they they're no longer saying 80,000 students. So that means 4,000 disappeared just by counting. Now they're saying 75,000. You know what's happened to seven and eight? Yes. And that's where the children were, and that's also where much of the movement has has gone from. So that's why it's been hard for us to believe that somehow uh, the the uh, the movement out of the city has been so colossal, but the school system remained exactly where it was. And it, it, we, it won't, it, 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 there's some credibility restored because at least the number has gone down so that we can see that there, there's accurate counting. Let me ask you about, um, in light of that, about this difficult problem that the school system has had. And one, I want to know if there is a continuing decline in student population and whether you anticipate that that will be the case. I mean, we're gaining population, but all the indications are that they are, you know, single people and, and um, married couples without children. Uh, and if, and uh, so one, in your long-range planning, do you see a decline in the student population? And, and two, what has happened to the properties that were to be sold that, once you close the school if there's a decline in student population, do you, do you see any more a consolidation or, or um, uh, closing of schools? Well, let me answer the first one. I think Ms. Newman can talk about the surplus properties. Uh, the control board's been tasked with that responsibility. Uh, you know, we've gone, we're going through this process of, of uh, implementing a long-range master's facilities plan. And one of the reasons why we rejected the plan last year is it did not deal with the demographic trends. And we really need, we don't want to talk about, we're talking about building or modernizing new schools. We don't want to build schools or modernize schools where there aren't going to be children. And so we are doing some statistical analysis to try to decide where the growths are in this city. It is true that the city is continuing to lose population, but uh, it is also true that that is being stabilized somewhat, and it is being offset to some degree, not the degree we'd like, by new folks coming into the city. My ward, as you mentioned, Ward 7, has lost more people in this city than any ward in the city over the past 10 years. But we do see home sales increasing from, by, by families, even in my ward. So the, the, the short answer to your question is, yes, we think that the school population is still declining, 
but we don't feel it's declining at the same rate. I think the renaissance in the city will be reflected in middle class families coming back in. I think that with some of the inroads we're making with public safety and even along the tax lines, I mean, I think that's going to have a, a uh, frankly, a heartening impact on that issue. But I think Ms. Newman can speak specifically about surplus property. Yes, I can, and I, I can't speak uh, in a way that uh, I'm very proud of. I think that uh, most of us who've been involved with the disposition of the uh, school property up until about two months ago have not been that comfortable that the process has run as smoothly as it should run. Uh, but uh, what I think we all are in agreement on right now is that uh, we need to see which of the schools are in process and where are there certain expectations that uh, there is a property to be disposed of. And then uh, what we need to do is to revisit uh, the policy and determine what I started to get along the way was uh, more public sentiment that the school system not sell the properties, but rather lease it. Well, that wasn't the uh, policy at the outset. So what I'm suggesting is that uh, once we see where, what's in, in uh, process and we take care of those up or down, that then we, through the public process of the council, revisit what is and should be the policy. How much uh, should there be a determination of the community impact and other community uses? And how much should only the bottom line be considered in the disposition of the property? I, I, I can understand the, your concern. Uh, and of course, you, you, could, you, you, you are getting competing notions here. One thing you don't want to have happen to you is what happened uh, to the city in the past. The city has closed schools. And these schools have become uh, uh, terrible wrecks in communities. So, so if you if you close the schools, went through all that pain, mm -hmm. then some disposition must be made of the school. Either the school, as you say, there are options. If you don't want to sell it, or you decide, uh, you know, on second thought, you shouldn't sell it. Then the only thing I'm asking is don't let happen what has happened in my neighborhood, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, the school site uh, became the focus for all of the dereliction in the neighborhood. It was the public school site, whereas people were taking care of their homes. It was the public school site because the public schools closed the site years ago and nothing ever happened to it. So the public thinks that having gone through of this terrible pain and turmoil, which of course was necessary to close the schools, that the site is going to be taken care of. I would only ask that a time limit be put on it. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, to say that by the end of this year, a decision will be made on what, will, what is the disposition of the closed schools so that we will not go into the year 2000 not even knowing uh, whether it's going to be sold or whether you've made another decision. Generally, you I would concur Absolutely. with that. I would concur with that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, a point of personal privilege. Mr. Singleton is a member of the elected school board, and I think he feels that I haven't properly represented the optimism and and the support for the elected school board and i would like to ask could he have a minute he's not he, he isn't sworn and uh, it had we we invited the school board to participate and their uh, leader did not show or notice why she wasn't showing I we see. will give an ample opportunity at another hearing i see all okay. right so. uh thank you Ms. Ms. chairman no more right, no you, more Mr. questions Horn. Mr. Horn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think uh, earlier in response to a question from the panel, uh, Superintendent, you mentioned the open enrollment policy of the district. Uh, do you have data on last fall's results of open enrollment, and has it been analyzed as to where a particular student was and where that student is now going? Uh, and is that data available and have you analyzed it in terms of is this a bad school that student was leading, uh, leaving from to go to what was perceived by parents and perhaps the child as a good school? And uh, what can you tell me about the analysis of that data? Um, again, we are in the process. This is the first year that we've put out our school profile, so we're looking at a variety of 
of data, including where our students attend schools. Uh, we'll be able to, uh, for the first time, take a look at that uh, as we look at all the data we've compiled by school. Um, there is movement across the, the uh, district and we can see within each school how many students are out of boundary. So uh, we can now, we'll be able to look at how many students are out of boundary and continue, how many students migrate back. Um, but in the past, again, we haven't kept that, we haven't looked at that data, but we now are compiling it in the new school profiles along with other data that will allow us to look at it and strategically plan, but to let parents look at. Well, that's where schools. I was leading. Have you thought of a random sample of the parents when you see some significant mm -hmm. uh, sort of more than normal change? Uh, either a person might have. Uh, bought a house in a mm -hmm. different type of neighborhood or not uh, and that uh, but the question is if they're still living at a certain address and changing schools that ought to be perhaps significant and are you thinking of doing a survey to uh, get more information we uh, uh, this is the second year that we surveyed all of our parents and there are a variety of questions uh, many of them relate to the school and what's happening in the school and since this is our second year we can now begin to compare what parents said uh, last year with the data that we have uh, this year when we get it back in fact um, the date uh, the surveys are in probably um, in all of our homes this week or they will be by the end of this week and we're expecting them back and we're going to do the comparison we're going to use it I'm a firm believer the data needs to drive the decisions uh, in the district and these surveys tell us a lot they told us a lot last year and they'll tell us even more about the progress that we're making in our individual schools we also surveyed our students and and staff uh, I suspect uh, you and I could agree that the principal sort of sets the tone for the school and makes the difference. Uh, I, my children uh, went to the D.C. schools when they were desegregated, two-thirds black in the particular junior high my daughter went to, superb education. Then the principal retired after many years, and the school started going downhill because the successor never left the principal's office. Right. The previous principal was out there in those halls, was tooting his whistle, new students by name, all the things that connect in terms of encouraging students to uh, get an education. So well, I hope you'd be looking at that and maybe hold some principals accountable. Well, last year we changed 39 principals. Um, I do believe that the victory is in the classroom with the teacher, but it's facilitated in the principal's office. If you see, want to see a good school, there's a good principal in the principal's office. Well, and as you know, that also means the principal ought to be backing up the teacher when there's Absolutely. discipline problems. And too often, principals have been just hiding behind the desk. I don't know how you find that as a superintendent, whether they're hiding under the desk or just <laughs> behind the desk, but I leave that up to your professionalism. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jordan, thank you, and I want to thank all of you. We, we may uh, submit some further questions, and Ms. Acker, I know you're going to get back to us with those test scores that we asked, and we'll make those part of the uh, record. Yes. Um, without objection, all written statements submitted by the witnesses will be made part of the permanent record, and the record will remain open for 10 days. Uh, the subcommittee will continue to work with all interested parties to achieve these objectives of making this a, a, a great school system, and these proceedings are closed. Good. All right.
20th anniversary series on the American presidents, join us tonight when we'll present a video record of all our presidents' programming from this week. We examine the life and times of Andrew Jackson, our seventh president. We'll bring you all our programs beginning at 8 p.m. Eastern here on C-SPAN. If you'd like to be more involved in C-SPAN's American Presidents Life Portrait Series, enter our contact.